Welcome to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, where we discuss all things political, bringing you the top stories locally, nationally, and from around the world. I'm Ruben Abati, and This Day Live begins now. Coming up in the next hour, the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, in the eye of the storm. The war of attrition between the Minister of Niger Delta Affairs, Senator Goswila Pabio, and former Acting Managing Director of the Commission, Joy Nunia, escalates. Just as the House of Representatives starts its probe into the affairs of the NDDC. With COVID-19 cases still on the ascendancy, US President Donald Trump insists it will not order Americans to wear face masks. In Nigeria, the Federal Airports Authority of Nigeria, FAN, condemns ex Amfara Governor Abdulaziz Yari for violating the COVID-19 airport protocol. And the Nigerian Senate votes against recognition of marital rape in the Criminal Code Act. What does this portend for the campaign against sexual assault in the country? The forensic audit ordered by President Muhammad Buhari into the finances of the Niger Delta Commission, Development Commission, NDDC, has for the better part of this year opened up a can of worms, starting from the dissolution of a substantive board of the commission to the constitution of an interim management committee to oversee the audit. The allegations and counter allegations of corruption have metamorphosed into a series of strong personality clashes among the several actors involved in the affairs of the NDDC. The war of attrition has virtually ground operations at the 20-year-old agency set up to close the infrastructure gap in the oil-rich Niger Delta region. And this reached a crescendo when the Minister of Niger Delta Affairs, Senator Gosso Lakwabio, and the ex-managing director of the commission, Joy Nune, descended to a public slanging march. But even as the public was digesting the attacks and counter-attacks from both sides, another drama played out last Thursday, when River State Governor Inyesom Wike carried out a rescue mission to prevent the arrest of Ms. Nune by the Nigeria police. She was scheduled to appear before the House of Representatives had a committee set up to prove the NDDC, which she eventually did the next day via teleconference. Well, joining us today to discuss the personality clashes, the National Assembly's involvement in the matter of the NDDC, and the future of this all-important agency are Iba Isine, journalist and former special advisor on communications to the former acting managing director of NDDC. Also, Mrs. Ubiaruko Christine Undukwe, president and founder of Citizens Quest for Truth Initiative. Welcome to This Day Live. Well, uh, Iba Aysine will join us uh, later, but now I have with me uh, Mrs. Ubiaruko Ndukwe. Mrs. Ndukwe, thank you, Ndukwe. Thank you very much for joining us on This Day Live. Thank you, Ruben. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Good to have you on This Day Live. Quickly, I mean, you run an NGO yes. uh, that focuses on good governance in the uh, Niger Delta. And now in the last week or so, uh, we've been having a lot of uh, controversies coming from the Niger Delta, with particular focus on the Niger Delta Development Commission. What's your take on this development, these personality clashes, and the various concerns about transparency and accountability? Yeah, well, um, uh, I was never surprised, you know, when the, the whole drama started playing out. It was all expected because... Um, for the president to have ordered a forensic audit, you know, for the Niger Delta Development Commission for a period of 19 years, it's actually expected that a lot of heads will roll, 
you know, toes will be stepped upon and uh, definitely there will be personality clashes, even though, as far as I'm concerned, the real masquerades are yet to be unveiled. What we are seeing is um, uh, what I would call a distraction, you know, from the real issues that border on the, on the development of the region compared to the huge sums that have been allocated uh, to the region for development through the, um, uh, the Niger Delta Development Commission. Uh, I, I just think that uh, Nigerians are interested in more drama than um, focusing on the real issues. As um, an NGO that has been involved, even before I set up the NGO, I've been uh, in, the, in River State you know, as a publisher and I'm very conversant with some of the happenings, the politics you know, that have played out in, um, since uh, the commission was established. You know, I can tell you that um, it probably was not never intended to, um, uh, to succeed because definitely there will be politics. You know? And um, in the past, we've had cases of um, um, the board accused of infractions and all whatnot. And uh, of course, they are sacked in most cases and then uh, new boards um, are, uh, are put in place. So for me, what is playing out now is um, a tip of the iceberg of what Nigerians will eventually get to find out if the forensic audit is allowed you know, to hold. If they can allow this forensic audit, Nigerians will be shocked at the level of rot and corruption and infraction in that commission. It's become, it's a cash cow, it's no longer, that's no news, that's no story. I mean, it's known to everybody. So um, if they can allow the forensic audit, you will see that the names that will appear, you'll be surprised, coming from all manner of places, from the uh, presidency in the past, from the uh, top hierarchy of the army, the police, and uh, the rest of them, and uh, even from the National Assembly. Everywhere, it's, it's something that has been on. But the only thing that has triggered this problem now is the president's decision to order for a forensic audit. And I tell you, whoever is saddled with that responsibility should have expected whatever um, is playing out now. Nobody is going to allow that forensic audit to be carried out because very many people, those who are fighting even through surrogates, through pseudos, through uh, proxies, are deeply involved in the rot in um, NDDC. In here. Is there actually a forensic audit going on? Because some people are saying there is no actual audit going on, and that if there is any, it should not be uh, uh, supervised by the interim management committee uh, that is in charge of the NDDC now. That it would have been better to have a board in place rather than an interim let management me, committee. Yeah, let me start with the last part of your question. Uh, you are saying that if at all there's a forensic audit, it should not be supervised by the INC. Like I said, it was expected. Even if you put a substantive board, the same thing will happen. People will kick because the board probably will only favor those who appointed them because that's the impression they want to give us, that the IMC is going to favor uh, some persons and leave out some persons. But the truth of the matter is that even when the president gave the order for a forensic audit and when he constituted the interim management committee and extended their tenure, he made it very clear that it is for the period of the forensic audit to supervise, to assist the forensic auditors. They are not the forensic auditors. The forensic auditors, the advert was put in place and uh, about 10 a lot, you know, and then people be there, companies be there, firms be there. So it's not the business of the IMC. No matter who, even if you bring the Pope John Paul or whoever, now it is still going, there will still be an outcry. So. Whatever anybody is telling you about the IMC not supervising it, if the IMC doesn't, who will? Is it the substantive board that will be appointed by politicians? And politicians, not you and I, but the same people who are also involved in the sleaze over the years. So what are we saying? Now let me go back to your first question. You are asking if the forensic audit is on. At least if nothing else, we are aware. We know when um, the forensic audit, the lead consultant, you know, we are handed over the documents they needed. And I tell you, there was a threat. The reason why many people are not aware that the forensic audit is going on is because of the secrecy. And the secrecy was because of uh, security issues. There were threats. There were plans to hijack the documents from them and possibly burn them. So the people, of course, their lives had to be saved. 
the documents have to be saved. So they were ferried onto, into an unknown place. They are not politicians. They are not regular names. What they had expected, most persons had expected, was for um, the federal government to hire um, uh, 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 names that are known to them, people that they could easily assess. So that's why some of them are kicking. Well, Which one is F, this firm, that firm? Because they are not names, they are not people they can assess in order to um, uh, do whatever they want to do. This so I tell you, as far as I'm concerned, the forensic audit is ongoing. And anybody who is saying that the forensic audit is not ongoing, it means that you are impugning on the integrity of the president, his ability to uh, hold the country. Because what are you saying? The forensic auditors are not working alone. The EFCC is represented. The ICPC is represented. Office of the Auditor General of the uh, country is there. The uh, Accountant General of the Federation is there. The well, CBN also is, is there. Great. So are you telling me that these agencies of government don't report to the president? Are you also saying that the DSS is not aware that these people are in a certain location getting this their job done? Can, now let me also tell you, me. there was an attempt to uh, use the BPP can you hear me? to stop the forensic auditors from assessing the project sites in the different states. We have nine states. That's why we have nine different lots, nine different companies. Firms well, Mr. Sundukwe, I'm sorry I have to interrupt you at this point. Law. And so it's difficult for uh, anybody can you hear me? of them to assess these uh, places. So they tried to use the BPP. And that's why the BPP said, no, this thing has to go on. Are you telling me that the BPP that is an agency of government Mrs. Sundukwe, does not report to the president? I mean, Mrs. they should be able to say things that are feasible. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but at this point, I would like to bring in Iba Isine, who is now uh, joining us. Iba, welcome to This Day Live. Thank you very much, uh, Ruben. Yes, I don't know whether you've been listening to uh, Mrs. Sindukwe on the issues in the uh, Niger Data Development Commission. I recall that you worked there. You were uh, Special Advisor Communications uh, to then Acting Managing Director Joy Nene. Uh, what did you observe? When you, when you walked briefly there. What are the issues? Mrs. Sindukwe has talked about some of those issues. What are the issues that you observe in terms of the governance process in the NDDC? Unfortunately, I was not able to listen to her because there was no sound given in any of the um, But um, let me start by talking about how I got to join um, Mrs. Joy, uh, Dr. Joy Nunia. I, I never knew her until 2018, and in the course of an investigation I was doing, a story I was doing, um, I, I I got to speak with her, and then I wrote my story. And when I published that story, she came out on me, she dragged me out, I said I didn't do very well, and I was angry, and um, I gave it back to her, and I, I told her nobody teaches me how to do my job. That was the first time we met. And um, we exchanged very hard words, and I told her I'm an independent journalist. I never ask you for money, I never ask you for any favor, and I will my job. Now, after um, she got the NDDC uh, job, I contacted her again. And uh, in the course of our conversation, she asked me to get somebody to work with her, somebody who has an international experience, somebody who has worked, um, has integrity and handled the job that um, she has not found really rely on to do the job. So I called a friend of mine in New York, he's a very senior journalist in the country, and asked him, he's listening to somebody. As we were back and forth trying to get that, she called me and asked me, uh, Iba, please come and work with me. And I, I refused for a long time. I refused, and then uh, my friend now asked me, "Okay, go and try." And I gave Joy Nunia three conditions uh, for me to work with her. The three conditions which I told her and she accepted was that she was going to be, I mean, uh, depart from what has been happening in the NDC because I've, I've been in the Niger Delta for as long as possible. I covered River State at the height of the insecurity, the, the militant crisis, and I know what was happening in the I know what is happening in the And so uh, one of the conditions was that she was going to uh, put up a serious governance structure to ensure that things are done 
very well in NDDC. NDDC achieves some of its commanders under her, no matter uh, how short she was going to say. So the second um, thing was that she will listen to me and respect me because um, uh, in, in, the, in my conversation with her prior to that, uh, we had a very, very tough uh, conversation and it was not funny. Uh, so I said she will listen to me. And then number three, that she would keep me within the ambit of the law, the enabling environment to do my job. And I must see her anytime I want to see her. And she should also accept my advice as she agreed to I went to the moment. Now, when I got there, it would interest you to note that I worked in NDDC, I joined her um, sometime in December. And then as of February, when we left, I, Madame did not approve any of the things that was due to me. Not that she was hating me. She invited me, and most of us who joined between December and January, she didn't approve anything. Because according to her at that time, it was true, the 2009 budget that we were supposed to run was still to be passed at the National Assembly. And some of these things were supposed to come from that uh, budget. And, and, and that was how we left. Till today, some of those entitlements have not been paid to me and some of those, some of us who work on. Now, let, let's go, let's go. Now, governance issues at the NDDC now, now, that go, you have observed as a reporter and also as someone who worked there. All right. That was, that was part of governance issue because she could have just picked money from anywhere. Madam um, Joy Nunier tried as much as possible to ensure that things were done properly. For instance, when we got when I got there, I learned they were owing about two or something trillion to contractors. What Madame did was to insist on not paying any contractor, to the best of my knowledge. She didn't pay any contractors, insisted that project must be verified, authenticated before payment. And that was why the verification process went on. There were three prongs. The verification, the confirmation, and then the field work. At the confirmation level, all the documents that were submitted to the various verification teams that went to the nine states would be checked against existing laws and regulations. Are they registered? Do they have a locus to do the job they did? And then we go to the field. That was the process we were on before Adam Nunez was uh, removed. I am also aware that uh, at that time, she stopped the issuance of scholarship, free scholarship, and had approved with the desk officers, all those records that they approved all the scholarship payment of all these uh, uh, scholars who are suffering uh, in abroad. They have really seen as some of them. Record system and the approval, approval uh, system in NDC is one of the best. It moves from one table to the other. The, the test officers know that there was an approval for the scholarship. However, she had insisted that scholarship should not be given the way it was before in the 2020 budget. The scholarship was supposed to go to one person each in every ward in the Niger Delta State. Apart from that, those who have first class in the region, even if one board has 10 first class candidates, they were supposed to be on that scholarship. The, the management of the management of the program. And anyway, Iba, Iba, I know we can use the old day, you know, to outline uh, what she did, but you know, uh, what's your take on this ongoing crisis between her and uh, Senator Akpavio and all this talk about secret tools and, you know, sexual harassment and all of that? I think it should have been handled better than that. Um, the personal lives of these two very distinguished son and daughter of the Niger Delta should not have been the issue. The issue is that we know that the NDDC has been uh, has not fulfilled its man its mandate to the Niger Delta. And that is the issue. Everybody knows that. But uh so it is now that because these two human beings are being declined, they, they are trying to crowd out the real issue of the corruption, the rot in the NDDC. And we should also be mindful of the fact that this issue is not all about joining 
Mimi and Kofi. This issue is about NDDC that has existed for over 20 years and has collected close to 15 trillion. And if 15 trillion naira has been collected, show me one headline project in the Niger Delta that you can point to to show that such humongous amount of money has been received. So we are just wasting time. This is about the rot in 20 years. And we should not. Right. Let me go quickly. Let me uh, bring uh, Mrs. Sindukwe back into the conversation. Mrs. Sindukwe, how uh, well do you know the, uh, the uh, personalities involved in the ongoing crisis? That, by that, I mean Senator Akpavio and uh, Dr. John Nune. And uh, what's your take on all this back and forth about sexual harassment, uh, mismanagement of contracts, and the taking of uh, alleged uh, fetish shots? Well, um, I, I have um, tried to restrain myself from uh, commenting on some of those uh, issues because um, uh, there are, they are issues that actually um, border on uh, personality. Yeah, much as I know um, Joy, uh, we talk, we've, had, uh, we've done things, politics together a bit, and uh, we were talking even before um, this whole thing uh, burst you know, open, and um, I think I, I know Joy more than I know Senator Akpabio. Let me be um, sincere here, but when I say no, I'm not talking about experiential knowledge, so it would be difficult for me to really comment on their uh, personalities and uh, uh, what goes on behind the scenes, you know, but like I said, this is basically a distraction. What the president set out to investigate, to find out, it's not about who um, harassed the other one. Those, those things can be handled uh, uh, by the security agencies. They know how to, or maybe they can even uh, probably bring in a, um, a lie detector to find out who is saying the truth and who is lying. But I think that we should be more cons uh, concerned with the aspect of the investigation that borders on the underdevelopment of the region. That is where my group comes in. We are more interested in the region than in the persons you know, involved. We started even before Senator Babio became a minister, we started doing our thing around the Niger Delta. You know, um, We were there even before Joy uh, was appointed you know, as the acting MD. So, and we will be there even when they leave. So it's not about them. I think that we are more concerned about the issues, the, the contract splitting, a situation where uh, uh, those who are supposed to perform oversight, what has happened over the years? Some of them have been in the assembly for, uh, from the seventh assembly to the ninth assembly in the same committees, you know, uh, supervising the NTDC. How come they were not able to find out this? There has been a statutory audit over the years, how come yeah, things kept on going from bad to worse? Nobody to bother to find out. And if suddenly President Buhari takes over government and all hell is let loose. Thank you very much, you Mrs. Sindukwe. For me, it's all Thank you, Mrs. Sindukwe. We've over. got to go now. Uh, thank you very much, Iba Isine. Uh, if there was time, I would have asked for your specific recommendations on how the NDDC could be repositioned. But thank you very much for the much we've been able to do. It's time now for a break here on This Day Live, the Sunday talk show. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Joining me now in the studio are Professor Bola Akintenwa, Director General of Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director, Enough is Enough and Chike Ogea, former commissioner for Information Delta State. Well, Prof. Yemi and uh, Chike, uh, welcome to today's edition of uh, This Day Live, this Sunday talk show. I'm sure the three of you listen to uh, Iba Aisine, uh, former media communications and communications advisor uh, to Dr. Joy Nene, former acting MD of the NDDC, and also uh, Mrs. Christine Ndukwe, who runs uh, an NGO in the Niger Delta. And the two of them raised quite a number of issues in relation to the drama that we have seen around the Niger Delta Development Commission. Uh, 
about accountability, and also about uh, personality uh, conflicts. Uh, Chike, I'd like to start with you. I mean, you are from the Niger Delta. Uh, so what's your take on all of this that is happening in your part of the country? Do you think that the people of the Niger Delta have been well served or they have been shortchanged? <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Ruben. This is a particularly a very, very sad time for all of us Niger Deltans. The truth is that, funny enough, all three of us are from Niger Delta. I mean, Yemi herself and then Prof. They are also Niger Deltans, and they have a stake. <laughs> and they, stay, they have a stake in this. But, but the truth is that um, it is a very, very sad time for me. I want to just read a little fact for you. It says that 2001, and six years later, $12 billion, $12 billion turned Dubai to what it is today. And it started in 2000, 20 years later, and $40 billion later, we have absolutely nothing to show for it. And that is, you know, putting it as succinctly as it should be put. And um, I think, though I lost the audio when the gentleman was speaking, but basically, I heard very well everything the lady spoke about. And that's why she kept on reiterating and saying that this thing is not about Joy Nunez and um, Senator Pabio, that they are just a distraction. And to an extent, I agree with her. Because for 20 years, with that kind of money that has gone into the Niger Delta, and just one project they have been struggling with, the east-west road, and we have still nowhere delivered anything on that road. And yet we are saying that for an amount of money that was much less than what has been put in there, in a shorter time, Dubai has delivered what it has delivered. I don't know whether anybody, you, I mean, to appreciate this, you must obviously have been to Dubai anyway, to understand that Dubai is now even making Europe look old. Dubai is a modern, smart city, being developed at, you know, the kind of rate you can't even understand. So basically, I think this has to do with governance issues. You don't even understand. Sometimes I begin to wonder that, even when we look at the legal perspective, the setting up of the NDC, NDDC as a, an interventionist uh, vehicle in the first place, the people that thought about it, was it something that was thought about it so that it, we can use it to sabotage ourselves, i.e. even the people from the national that brought it down to the state? Because I don't understand. They, they, it's like the thing it was just designed to fail, ab initio. And by the time they find the actors that obviously are Niger Deltans that go in there, what happens? The monies just develop wings and fly. And all we hear are different stories, different dramatic personnel. People just come, people just go. In fact, over with all the things we've been hearing, we've heard that it was meant for politicians when they have um, ambitions and they have offices they are looking forward to going into. You send them to NDDC. They find the money for the campaigns there. They, they obviously empower a few of their friends. And everybody goes away. OK, let me uh, come to Yemi here in the studio. Yemi, I'm sure. You also agree with uh, many Nigerians that enough is enough at the uh, NDDC. Uh, what do you think we need to do to reposition that agency? Should we keep the politicians out of appointments in the place and ensure that only non-politicians have access to the NDDC? Because there are other agencies of government where contracts are awarded and work is done. Why is it that at the NDDC all we hear is, uh, you know, the spending of money without results? Um. Thank you. I think two things. One, I think it's both it, the dramatic personnel, as uh, Chikyo calls them, I think are a reflection of why NDDC is problematic. If the breakdowns that we're seeing, for example, from the audits are anything to go by, it shows that if you can steal such large amounts of money, unfiltered, unhindered, then the design of the commission itself be, becomes just that, a vehicle for stealing money, because that's all it is. So number one, I think a commission like the NDDC should be interventionist by design, which means it should be short. It should have a lifespan. So if we're trying to, which is the whole essence of it was, was trying to bridge a gap in infrastructure. So we say over 20 years, if we look, look at the Dubai model, 
Over 20 years, these are uh, landmarks we want to hit. This is how much we're going to commit to it. And then that is monitored. And then to your second point, yes, then it's not a, a, a tool for politicians. You get people who are just there as, as project managers to deliver on projects. Because what we've turned it into is because we have the NDDC, we now want a Northwest Development Commission. We want a Northeast Development Commission. Soon we'll want a Southwest Development or a not. So it becomes exactly that. And I think that that is a problem. But I think so that we don't lose sight of that. Yes, as dramatic and distracting as it might be, I think the drama between Senator Akwabio and Joy Nune speaks to the fundamentals of why NDDC as a, as, a, as a commission is problematic when it's seen as someone's personal, in a sense, personal fiefdom to do as he pleases. And then the sort of response to that, where you can then use the apparatus of the state in the police to then show up at a woman's house at 4 a.m. and the commissioner of the police and the IGP have the audacity to say that it is acceptable behavior. So when you see that pattern, then it, it really lets us know what is, what is the problem. So it's not just about NDDC, but how we use the instruments of state to steal money and then to oppress or keep people quiet. Well, Prof, let me come to you here. Um, you listen to the conversation much earlier on. What are your own recommendations? I subscribe to the earlier points made by Shike. I also support wholeheartedly the submission of Yemi. Mm -hmm. And more interestingly, I think uh, both um, Esine and uh, Christine Ndukwe had given us raw materials to deal with. The first issue raised by Christine Ndukwe was that um, she's not in any way surprised about uh, current developments. Mm. And that uh, it is as a result of, quote and unquote, you know, the situational reality there that has prompted the uh, appointment and the forensic um, auditing. In this case, he said, we are yet to see anything that what is currently happening is just a tip of the iceberg. He's now saying that we should expect more fantastic revelations. That one we should note. Now he's now saying that we discovered that a chief, a high chief, a professor, a minister, people from all nooks and crannies of the polity will be involved. So that's to let you know that look, when Shike was saying that uh, in 2000, when the NDCC was put in place, there was this amount of money, no, no outcome, we couldn't see anything. Nigeria has always been, it is, and is most likely to remain, the terra cognita for corruption. <laughs> so, um, on the one hand, we preach against corruption, but... The summoners, the preachers, they are themselves the agents of corruption. That's the first point. Um, Esine gave us the background or the foundation of what we all know. That is a political governance in Nigeria. He told us about the three conditions he gave to Nune before he could accept his appointment. And that uh, as at the time he was even speaking here, his entitlements have not been paid. If he's, um, if he's talking about his joining her in 2018, I can say that, look, I have not been paid my <laughs> entitlements since uh, 2015, that I have to take um, my former office you know, and people there to court. So you see, the, what is not normal in Nigeria is that I have discovered, like a, a scene is trying to draw our attention to it, it is not good to be honest in Nigeria. Mm. <laughs> when you are honest, you are well, prosecuted. Well, we hope that people will learn to be and, honest. <laughs> yes, I know honesty is the best uh, policy. Pol policy. We all know that. But the system does not allow for patriotism. Mm. It doesn't allow for honesty. When you try to fight dishonesty, all right, 
the powers that be, the agents there, they will write malicious reports against you. You will not even have access there. Well, so this is the issue. Prof, let's hope that the uh, forensic audit at the NDDC will yield uh, uh, the best outcomes in terms of uh, looking at all the details. And at the end of the day, that agency uh, will be repositioned uh, for the uh, purpose for which it was it created. Was yes, because it was established to promote development in the Niger Delta. And that's why I said, look, the people have been uh, shortchanged. Now, let's quickly take another topic. As global infections of COVID-19 passed the 14 million mark last week, and for the first time recorded a surge of 1 million cases in under 100 hours, there was no better evidence that the coronavirus pandemic was showing no signs of slowing down. But despite the ominous clouds, particularly in countries like the U.S., with more than 3.7 million cases and 140,119 deaths, the country's president, Donald Trump, remains adamant against ordering Americans to wear face masks to contain the spread of the virus. His refusal came after the country's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, urged state and local leaders to be as forceful as possible in getting people to wear masks. Here in Nigeria, with no end in sight on the number of new infections, politicians and so-called VIPs are violating the health protocol on COVID-19 in public places. Just last week, the Federal Airports Authority of Nigeria, FAAN, was forced to censure former Governor Abdulaziz Yari of Zamfara State for breaching the protocols put in place to arrest the spread of the virus. Yari was reported to have forcefully pushed away an officer of the Environment Department at the Kano International Airport when the latter insisted on disinfecting the ex governor's luggage. Yari's behavior once again brought to the fore the conduct by certain personalities who believe that they are above the law. Prof, let me start with you this time around. Well, the positivity rate is going up in many parts of the world, not just in the United States, uh, but also in India, particularly, uh, where you know, uh, they now have more than one million cases. Also, of course, in Brazil, in Mexico, and in about 24 states of the United States. But then we have this other story from Nigeria about VIPs uh, not showing the right example. Well, I think we need to rethink the concept of a VIP. Yeah. Ordinarily speaking, it means very important personality. But I want to tell you that uh, the case of um, a governor uh, of a state being considered very important, I think uh, the people of Nigeria should simply put him where he really belongs. He's not even important, not to even talk about very important. He's not. And I have to say this, bearing in mind the consequences of what I am saying, that look, here, any governor, by virtue of his election, he uh, should be seen as a servant leader. Nothing more than that. The mere fact that a governor will have the effrontery to assault, to insult, to bring to a lower level an agent of government put in place to prevent, you know, the spread of virus. I think uh, it should be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. And uh, that prosecution should not just be uh, a treatment on, under a very important personality. No. You see, if we do not deal squarely with leaders that do not care about the welfare, the health, the progress, the protection of the civil society, I think the law should well, be brought to apply. Well, it's not just leaders behaving badly. I think ordinary people, too, are behaving badly. No, no, Only the, yesterday in Quara, in Illori, about 50 young persons were arrested uh, because they went to a nightclub. 
and they were not observing physical no, distancing. No, I agree with you. There's a fundamental difference between people who are required to provide leadership by example. Okay, but you mean, what's your take? No, I completely agree with Prof. And I think this whole debating what to do with them, I mean, I like Simon Kola um, at the back of this day calling them today very important patients. Because, I mean, regardless of the track record of some of their colleagues who've tested COVID positive, the fact that they continue to do this and thereby sending wrong signals to citizens who think it's not a big deal. So instead of Senate debating what, what should be done to them, fans should have clear guidelines. The same way you remove someone from a plane without wearing a mask or not let the person enter the airport without wearing a mask. The same way they should apply the same things to so-called VIP and have the backing of the president to do that. So if they are unable to fly on or have access to land at particular airports, then maybe they will receive some sense. Well, Chike, let me come to you. I mean, you uh, work at the airports. You, you know the airports <laughs> better than everybody here. Is it that there is a new, a, another set of rules uh, for VIP passengers? No, really, there shouldn't be. Um, it shouldn't be so at all. Uh, but um, we all know that... Um, you know, when that um, information came during the week, I was very surprised because the minister there right now, I know, is very, very proactive and he's very knowledgeable about the industry. And I know he has been, you know, making all the right sounds and uh, sights and sounds and doing the right things. So just like Yemi said, it is about enforcing the guidelines. You see, aviation is not a Nigerian issue. It is a globally internationally benchmarked issues. And we have all the protocols there, ICAO, <coughs> IATA, they're all there. And they should just be followed. NCAA is the ombudsman, <coughs> excuse me, they are, they are the policemen of the, of, of the sector. So they, it, 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 it's about them waking up and working in tandem with FAN and making sure that these protocols are adhered to. And just like Yemi said, whether you're a governor, whether you're a VIP, we know what we should do. It's not a matter of just coming on, on air and calling names and all of that without particulars. Because, by the way, this governor we are talking about has actually come out to say he did not, he did not even travel with any baggage. But Fan is sending out some tweets and saying this and saying that. So it ends up being a he said, she said. Who are we going to believe? We're all not there. So what I'm saying is that the airport authority, they know the right thing to do. NCAA knows the right thing to do. And I think, you know, even the minister is going way above his own remit by, you know, getting into the arena with all that. Between FAN and NCAA, they should sort this out and then get the, 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 the clearest backing from the highest levels of government. Well, again, you see, this is what we keep saying every day. In a situation where we don't seem to have anybody in charge of the whole of the government, this is what we are saying. So what is happening in aviation is just a microcosm of what is happening everywhere. You know, that is why there are battles, little battles everywhere. You know, one minister is driving away uh, Abika Dabiri from somewhere, Malami and Magu are fighting somewhere, mm -hmm. another person is telling um, Ngige that Ngige is talking rubbish after Ngige removed some people in his, um, in his, um, one of his agencies, a director there comes out and says, because you put in so many cars, you did this, you did that. So the whole place is just, you know, well, it, 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 I don't on, know. On that note, Chike, let's quickly take our last story of the day. Last week, the Nigerian Senate rejected an amendment that would have corrected a blind spot regarding marital rape in the Criminal Code Act Amendment Bill of 2020. The bill, first read in September 2019, was sponsored by Senator Remy Tinubu, representing Lagos Central Senatorial District, and was passed after the presentation of a report by the chairperson of the Senate Committee on Judiciary, Human Rights and Legal Matters, Senator Okpeyemi Bamidele. However, during a close-by-close -close consideration of the bill last Wednesday, Senator Uche Kunife, representing Anambra Central, raised a motion to amend Clause 5 to include explicit prohibition of rape involving a husband and wife. Section 6 of the Principal Act specifically excludes married couples from its definition of unlawful canon knowledge, meaning it cannot be legally recognized in court that a husband raised, raped his wife, or vice versa, even if consent was not provided. Yemi, 
<laughs> I'll bring, bring this to your doorstep. Uh, I mean, there have been attempts to uh, redefine rape, uh, you know, in our, in our uh, status. But uh, marital rape remains, uh, <laughs> you know, legal, if you like, in Nigeria. A woman can only charge for assault, yeah. but a husband cannot rape the wife yeah. or vice versa. What do you think? Um, two things. I think, just to quickly add to what Chike said about the governors, governor of, the, governor of Tariba, Fintiri, was also um, um, accused by Fan of breaking protocol, and I haven't heard him de um, debunk that. So if we're looking for a governor to use as a cape goat, the governor of um, Taraba provides, provides that. But to this matter, I think it's not surprising at all. I think maybe there are seven women in the Senate in a 109-man chamber. So the fact that men don't want that in the books should not surprise anyone. But I think, and so it's a journey that will continue on to get it into the books. But I think Lagos State provides an example that the Lagos State laws don't explicitly recognize marital rape, but they do, in the, as you said, recognize assault. So if, if the case is brought forth as assault, it could be framed in that regard and the woman can get justice. But yeah, it's a journey that has to continue. I mean, we've seen what has happened over the last um, two, three months in the in the spike of rape, the Minister of Women Affairs said under the lockdown there were over 3,000 cases of rape reported. That's just reported. So it is, it's um, not surprising, but as we continue to get more women into the National Assembly, over time, I expect that to change. Because, I mean, marital rape or rape of any sort is a violation of the dignity of the person, Indeed. whether male or, or female. female exactly. Well, Chike, what are your thoughts? Quickly. Quickly. You know, this takes me back to my first profession, because really I'm a lawyer before I even went into aviation. And, um, you know, as, as um, funny or odd or as it, you know, as it might sound, the truth is that the lawyer will ask a question in court. Can you rape yourself? Because the man and his wife are one person. The doctrine of the unity of spouse. That is right. So really, if you look at it strict to sensu according to the law, that is the right thing. And it's even a woman that is, who is not a man. It's a woman that is recognizing that. Doesn't that tell you, talk volumes about it? But like you rightly said, yes, we know. Well, we we know. It. She was the one that raised it to be included. Oh, she raised it to be included. Oh, yes. okay. And then that's why I said okay. because the Senate is oh, majority okay. men. Okay, okay. It, yeah. Okay, yeah. But you see, this is really the law. You see, I was wondering because this is really the law. And, um, you know, there are good laws, there are bad laws, but what is the law? Is a law. And this is even common law. This is not Nigerian law. This is common law. This is law that is applicable universally, if you understand what I mean. Now, but there are boundaries and there are things that can be used. That, yes, a woman or a man, indeed, might not at all times be ready to have consensual sex with the spouse. And if a spouse obviously forces you or act, gets you to act against your will, yes, you can sue on that, like we talked about the case of abuse and all of that. And that is why even in Lagos, as proactive as Lagos is in, um, especially when the vice president was the attorney general here, I know they made a lot of, um, a lot of advances with modernizing their laws and all that. They couldn't get to do a 360 on that. And that is the main well, reason. Quickly, before you know? we go, yeah. uh, Prof, let me uh, have your thoughts on this. I think the issue is uh, how to reconcile lawful wife and unlawful sex. <laughs> now, <laughs> I like that. You, you, you see, uh, I, like that. I, I subscribe with the argument of um, Shiki, <laughs> the, the doctrine <laughs> of oneself, the wife being the better half. All right, and vice versa. In this case, I think what is at stake, voting against or even for recognition uh, wouldn't solve the problem. The issue is simply that if there is love, true love between the husband and wife, there will never be any situation of saying you refuse sexual advances on both sides. It's as no, you as can refuse, but then you will not be forced if there is true love. No, no. <laughs> so you no. can refuse, there is nothing but then like, be forced. There is nothing like force. <laughs> the, the, you see, rape only 
arises mm. when there is a dispute between the two of them, when they are quarreling. Okay. When well, they are all right, there that will note. never be any case any to refuse. refuse. <laughs> on that yes. note, on that note, thank you very much, Chike Ogat. Thank you, Yemi Adam Olokun. Thank you very much, Professor Bola Akintarewa. We've got to go. We'll be here again next week. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. For my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching. See you next Sunday.